Maxwell? Here. McGuire? Here. Michaels? Here. Mitchell? Here. Quisenberry? Here. Rosales? Here. Schrader? Here. Schwartz? Here. Shore? Here. Weibel? Here. Alex? Here. Anderson? Here. Berkson? Here. Carter? Cowart? Petrie? Present. Uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Shore will be do the do the reading for March. Thank you very much, Mr. Shore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I take a lot of inspiration from those fallible individuals who have come before us uh, in, uh, you know, helping to move us forward. And so today, I'm going to read from American Creation, which is a, a 2007 uh, history by uh, Joseph Ellis. The success of the founders was partially attributable to their ideological and even temperamental diversity. Although George Washington was first among equals within the leadership class of the revolutionary generation, we speak of the founders in the plural for a reason. The American founding was a collective enterprise with multiple players who harbored fundamentally different beliefs about what the American Revolution meant. Adams and Jefferson went to their graves arguing with each other about what they had actually founded and how they had managed to do it. Political and personal diversity enhanced creativity by generating a dynamic chemistry that surfaced routinely in the form of competing convictions whenever a major crisis materialized. Every major decision produced a bracing argument among founders of different persuasions about revolutionary principles. This not only enriched the intellectual ferment, but also replicated the checks and balances of the Constitution with a human version of the same principle. So I hope we can keep that in mind as we debate. Thank you, Mr. Shore. Now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please read the notice of the meeting? Notice is hereby given that a regular meeting of the County Board, Champaign County, Illinois, will convene on March 19, 2015, 6 30 p.m., in the Lyle Shields Meeting Room, Brookins Administrative Center, 1776 East Washington Street, Urbana, Illinois, in said county for the purpose of allowing and ordering payments of claims against the county, receiving and acting upon reports of committees, and such other matters as may be brought before said meeting, which said meeting shall continue in session in session from day to day until the completion of said business. Thank you. Can I have a motion for approval of the agenda and addendum? Mm -hmm. Mr. Rosales, uh, Mr. Esri, a second. Are there any uh, additions or corrections to the agenda? All of those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. All right, thank you very much. For the record, I'm going to read in our next uh, meetings and our standing committees. Uh, facilities will be touring ILEAS on the 9th of April, and then we'll be meeting on the 9th of April back in the Lyle Shields room at 6.30. They're touring, the tour begins at 5.15 if the public would like to join that tour. Uh, environmental and land use will be meeting also on that same date, the 9th of April, due to the fact that we have election on the 7th. Uh, environmental and land use will start their meeting at 6.30, but they will be in the Putnam Room that evening. And highway and transportation will be meeting on the 10th of April, which is Friday at 9 a.m. in the, highway, uh, the county highway building. Committee of the Whole is scheduled for the 14th of April at 6.30 in the Lyle Shields room and the county board meeting. Uh, county board will have a study session this coming Tuesday on the 24th of March. That begins at 6 p.m. and the public is welcome to attend our study session. And then our regular board meeting for April is scheduled for the 23rd of April beginning at 6.30 in the Lyle Shields room. Uh, I'll entertain a motion uh, for the consent agenda. Hold, Ms. Petrie, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, at the last facilities meeting, uh, it was, we were told that we would be meeting 
in the executive conference room at the Ilias building. Has that changed? Yes, it has, and the reason for the change is if the meeting is held at the uh, Ilias building, it cannot be videotaped. And so uh, there was um, negotiation and rearrangement, and so that meeting will be in the Shields room so it can be taped, and uh, ELEC will be next door in the Putnam room that evening. Just for that, because the election is on the 7th of April, <clears throat> on which is Tuesday. Are there any other questions? Thank you. All right, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda, please. I, I would like to ask that something be taken from the consent agenda. All right, do you want to do that first before we get the motion on the floor? Uh, typically, typically. All right, it, go ahead. I think we have pulled things from consent before we That's moved fine. it. And, That's fine, go okay. ahead. Um, and I would like to um, a poll from the... Sorry, the, from ELUC um, B2. B All right, uh, B2 has been pulled from the consent agenda, so Mr. Esri will take care of that then. Anything else to be pulled from the consent agenda this evening? All right, now I'll entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Mr. Esri. Second. Uh, Mr. Quisenberry seconded that. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? All those in favor? Roll call, that's right, I know it. Roll call, I was on a roll. Esri? Yes. Parker? My Harrison? Yes. Parkey? Yes. Jay? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Quisenberry? Yes. Rosales? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Schwartz? Shore? Yes. Weibel? Yes. Alex? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Berkson? Yes. Co Coert? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Um, I have uh, four slips for public participation uh, this evening. And the first person is Patricia LaRoe. And just to remind you of our rules, since you haven't been uh, before us for a little bit of time, is uh, each participant in, in public participation gets five minutes, and we have a total of an hour for public participation. And we now have a clock that you can see up on the screen. Oh, it's not up. It will be up momentarily. And it's a countdown clock. And so when your time is up, you will see red, it goes from green to yellow to red. So please go ahead. My name is Patricia LaRoe. I live at 1406 Carroll Avenue, Urbana, Illinois, 61802. I've lived there since 1968. I have tried county board. I've had um, county zoning. I've tried to get new walks. I got new sewers out there. After the sewers was put in, the walk started uh, falling down. After the walk started falling down, I tried to get some help. I've been to the county umpteen times. I've called, no answer. I have houses down the streets ready to fall down, garbage in the, in the buildings, knocked out windows, and everything else. There's handicapped people that live next door to me. And it's not only me, it's down the street. On the next block, I have garbage sitting out in the front yard, all covered up, cockroaches. This is the way people are supposed to live. And so then I've called zoning about this, nothing done. He has a garage sale every year. The man said, don't buy anything, I don't buy nothing. So you know my question is, I expect the county board to speak up for these things. The buildings need to be tore down. There's people in wheelchairs go around my neighborhood. They can't walk because of the walks. The buildings are ready to fall down, garbage. 
I live a block, I live four doors behind a building. The house is ready to fall down. People bought the place. They moved to uh, uh, Sydney. When they moved, they left the house. There's uh, animals in it dead. Is this the way people are supposed to live in the Carol edition? If it is, I'll move. I don't think we should have to live like this when it comes to people on the county board, zoning, or anybody else. You people are sitting in a job, and if you can't do the job, I'd like to know why. If I had a job, I'd do my job. Walks, you go around the neighborhood, trucks parked on the walk, neighbor down the street. They don't complain, they expect me to speak up. You people speak up, I don't want to get involved. No, they don't want to get involved, because why? They know I will speak up. I'm not from Urbana, I'm from Champaign. I moved there when my husband I married. But my question is, I do expect to live clean. I live clean in my neighborhood, on my neighbor, on my area. The rest of the neighborhood looks like a city dump. Are you people trying to help anybody? No. You all know about it that's from county zoning. They all know it. I've called them umpteen times. Nothing. We can't do nothing. You're in the township. Am I in the township, county, or the city, or the state? We don't get no answer from nobody. It's just a runaround, and I don't take a runaround from nobody. I used to work at the county for 10 years, kept my job up good, and I expect the county to do the same thing with me. And if you can't do it, I'd like to know why. Zoning's known about these houses out there for umpteen months. One time they're in court, the next time they got a lien again, and the next time it's something else. Garbage sitting in the building. Handicap place right next door to it with the whole building full of handicap. It's city, but this isn't city. That's county. County knows about it. Right across the street, house ready to fall down. County knows about it. Are they doing anything? No. Around the corner, vehicles on the walk. County doing anything? No. On the next block, garbage sitting out in the front yard seven days a week. People walk around the neighborhood just like they would around any block. They like to walk. See this stuff? Oh my God. So what happens? They don't want to come back to the neighborhood because it looks like a city dump. I told my husband if it wasn't for my age, I'd have done moved out of the state of Illinois, not out of the county, just completely state. Because Champaign cares and Urbana don't, and neither does the county. And I think it's about time they start speaking up and taking care of the people in the area when it comes to walks, roads, and things like that. Don't shove me from county to township, township to county. Oh, it's not my responsibility, it's somebody else's. This is all I've heard, and I will not take another answer for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next is Mr. Hall. Thank you. I hadn't been called Mr. all day. You probably take that back <laughs> later. My name is Larry Hall. Uh, live at 177 County Road 1600E, Villa Grove, and it is in Champaign County. This evening, class or case 791AT14 to amend conditions and provisions for heliport restricted landing areas and restricted landing areas for Champaign County comes back to you from the ZBA and ELUC committees to make permanent the amendment which was implemented on a temporary basis last year. Literally three years of case work and follow-up went into this amendment. Alternatives and options were discussed in great detail and minimal differences of opinion were considered and compromised in both the ZBA and ELUC along with considerations of feedback from you, the county board, at that time. To my knowledge, the amendment has survived this year with no problems or exceptions. The provisions of the amendment satisfy the concerns expressed previously on behalf of the citizens of Champaign County, as well as the zoning administration, who I should add, have put 
in countless hours in this effort. The provisions of the amendment will remove a large area of controversial subjectivity from the county's review process in the future of any applications for both heliport restricted landing areas and restricted landing areas while enhancing the safety of the citizens of Champaign County and providing protection and preservation of our valuable nat natural resources located in Champaign County. We support and ask for your acceptance of the recommendation from the ZBA and ELUC by making permanent the provisions of the amendment. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, next is Ms. Hall. Good evening. My name is Julia K. Wright Hall, and I'm here tonight to support the adoption of Amendment 959, which is Zoning Case 791-AT14. The adoption of this ordinance should ensure the safety and welfare of the citizenry of Champaign County in future matters concerning the location of heliports and or restricted landing areas. I wanted to thank the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Environmental Land Use Committee, and the County Board for their patience, time, and, and diligence in resolving this matter, and I certainly hope that it gets resolved this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Ms. Fisher. There. My name is Jean Fisher, and I reside at 195 uh, County Road, uh, 1600 East in Villa Grove. I'm one of the uh, one of uh, 32 people who signed a petition for the preservation and protection of the CR district. Um, as you know, only one percent of Champaign County is in um, the CR district, so that is um, area that's bordered by um, taller trees, forested areas, uh, watershed, um, river, creek areas, um, and uh, wildlife and uh, the beauty, um, natural resources within it. Um, and so as being a member of one of the, the people who wanted to preserve and protect um, this area, um, we of course um, were very interested in having the amendments uh, made for the RLAs um, and the HRLAs. Um, to ensure the protection of these vital resources, um, we brought forth um, some ideas to uh, zoning, who worked very diligently um, on those ideas and uh, did a tremendous job coming up with um, protections for the county even and for the citizens um, within Champaign County and the Conservation District. Um, we think they did a great job. ELUC um, passed um, the ordinance um, and we are very anxious to see the new permanent restrictions um, and protections for the CR district go into place. Um, we feel it's it's long overdue um, and uh, anxiously uh, would support support the amendment and um, hope that the board approves tonight and um, we have those permanent um, amendments in place. Thank you very much for allowing me the time. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Um, I'm having a little trouble reading the last name. Is it uh, Ms. Horton? Oh, okay, she's busy. Uh, then uh, Ms. Vera Weiss. Good evening, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, as you might have noticed, I passed out a couple of different sets of papers here. Um, 
related to the criminal justice planning that's been done for the county and some of the consultant reports that you've received. Uh, I realized that when I was trying to make sense of what was in each report and did they agree on different things and what was the different emphasis, uh, it was a lot to review, a total of 300, more than 350 pages between the three reports. Um, and so I decided to make up a matrix for my own benefit and for community members. And I thought it would also be especially useful for new members of the board as well as for those who haven't looked at it for a while. Um, I did not consider the facilities issues on uh, this document because you've heard a lot about that recently. Um, and because it of a matter of space and how much to handle on that. But I hope that it will be useful. It was convenient uh, using the uh, community Justice Task Force as the, the framework to report it in just because they had 10 specific uh, high priority recommendations. And it was very interesting to me that uh, even the National Institute of Corrections report from 2011 touched on, um, on those uh, recommendations, including the recommendation for restorative justice. So I hope that this will be useful for you. I um, also you know, noticed that there were lots of items that were in the ILPP report that were not on the Community Justice Task Force report. Theirs was the 270-page report. And so I made um, copies of their key recommendations and additional recommendations from their action plan. And I think that they provide a good framework to be able to um, kind of check back and see which ones have been accomplished and which ones haven't. I realize that just because the consultant recommends it doesn't mean that the county and the staff decide that these are things that should be done. But I think that, um, that they're clearly things that are worth consideration. Um, and very importantly, because of the budgetary issues, I know that uh, it's important to have other funds besides what's coming from us taxpayers uh, to fund the different projects that are recommended here. And so I want to commend the county staff and uh, county officials that have worked on the three grant applications that you all approved for submission in the consent agenda uh, and that you have agreed that if awarded that you will go ahead and take those those grants and make use of um, of the funds that they provide. I think that they're focused on some of the things that a number of us in the community um, are really interested in, which is seeing programs that will make a difference uh, to decrease crime, to make it a safer place, to provide for some of the needs of, of our community in ways that are very important, and that these are also um, projects that will be expected to save money for the county. Um, and finally, one of the topics that's um, mentioned in, um, the re in the ILPP report and in Community Justice Task Force report is establishing a racial justice task force. And I believe that doing that is another way that will um, help to understand why we have the overrepresentation of the African American uh, population in the jail and in the system and figure out to what extent um, that um, a number of different procedures and uh, interactions should be changed to prevent those situations from coming up and to um, for the betterment of the community. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the helpful documents. We appreciate it very much. Um, is it Moran, Ms. Moran? Oh, Horton. Horton, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I was having a little trouble. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, hello. My, uh, my name is Erica Horton. I'm representing Planners Network with the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University. Um, and we have gone through the report proposal that was um, presented to you all on um, by Kimmean Associates on a proposal for a new jail. Um, and so we, we took a look at this from a critical analysis standpoint as a um, planning proposal. And we had a few observations that, that we just wanted to share. Um, the main things that we 
looked at were um, how well it responded to the RFQ, um, the audience uh, data analysis and some possible discrepancies and scenario planning. So uh, in regards to the RFQ, the report uh, addresses the request to determine the number of beds and an optimal configuration for normal housing units as well as for inmates with mental health issues. Um, the needs assessment for mental health inmates was thorough and objective, and the report clearly exposes a deficiency in how we currently handle this issue. Um, determining spatial design and configurations needs of the challenges of the current jail was done very professionally with great attention to detail. Um, in terms of future projections for population and needs, the projections were done solely at a status quo level. Uh, we did, there was no alternative projections and scenarios considered. Um, and the RFQ also provides nearly identical language in its request for building costs and operational costs, um, yet the amount of detail provided in the report for each category is drastically different. Um, in terms of audience and participation, uh, we found it a bit odd that there was no executive summary. Um, it's unusual for a plan of this scope and detail to not have that. Um, this is intended to state the objectives, methodology, and conclusions of a study uh, clearly and concisely and it's unreasonable to expect interested but busy readers to, to really sit through and sit and go through this 200-plus-page uh, 200 200 page report to get the main points. Um, so we believe that if you want the general public to understand, be able to understand what you're proposing, the executive summary is one of the primary tools uh, to promote that accessibility. Um, we also did not find any stakeholder input. Um, a, common feature of any plan at all stages of the process is an assessment of the stakeholders' position on the issues. So this not only legitimizes the planning process, but informs decision making and enhances the visioning process. So uh, stakeholders such as inmates or their families were, were what we particularly considered. Um, in terms of data discrepancies, the report uh, talks about arrests linked to traffic violations and drawing from a 20-day snapshot of daily inmate classification reports taken from the months of April through July 2014, uh, Kimmy and Associates estimated that 5% of the jail population was um, there for traffic-related offenses. Um, this was very different from what we had seen in data that we've looked at previously. So we went back to the data of arrest records that we have from 2014 and took two different snapshots. Um, we excluded DUIs from traffic-related arrests, and still in one found 13%, and the other found 15%. Um, and in terms of scenario planning, the RFQ details that all discussions should also include the flexibility of design to adapt to changing facility needs over time and to determine the number of beds. Uh, it is stated in the report that we have had a declining jail population over the last several years. Um, the claim at the study session that the request was to keep the, about the same current number um, of beds is not, is not uh, supported by what uh, our interpretation of the RFQ. Um, we also um, found a number of other jail plans that Kimmy and Associates has put together, um, which talk about many ways to reduce the jail population. So uh, in a jail de uh, developed for Marathon County, Wisconsin, uh, Kimmy and Associates determined that the jail population could be reduced by roughly 12% by taking several steps to reduce disposition timeframes of pretrial felons. Um, so if this was, this was not constrained by the RFQ, this was something that they could have looked at. So um, we're just interested in why they left out such a significantly different scenario from the planning process. And, why the um, population projections didn't take into account the potent potential effects of some diversion diversionary strategies that they've said uh, to other counties, suggested to other counties as ways to effectively reduce the jail population. Thank you very much. Are there any others in the audience who would like to speak this evening? If not, then I will close public participation for this evening. Um, are there any communications from the various board members? Yes, Ms. Michaels. Thank you, and if you'll indulge me, 
Um, I received a very nice um, email from Dustin Ehler on the Gifford Village Board. Um, basically, they had a meeting, and uh, during that meeting, they got into a discussion about how fortunate we have been in receiving grants to help with our recovery. One thing is for certain, the Village of Gifford would not be where it is today without the help of Champaign County Board allocating the hours from CCRP to help us with grant writing and administering. Susan Cheveria from CCRP has played an important role in getting us this far. Her success in grant writing for Gifford is 100%. We have received well over a million, closer to two, in grants, and, think, and she thinks there may be more opportunities in the near future. Thanks to Susan once again, the dust is settled, the smoke has cleared, and Gifford will have basically new infrastructure and will almost be debt free. Words cannot express our gratitude, and I wish there were more we as a village could do to reciprocate. Please pass this message of thanks and gratitude to your fellow board members. And once again, thank you. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Esri. Um, it was brought up at our caucus to kind of tie in with that. On the 28th will be another tree planting up at Gifford. Um, basically organized, I believe, by Farm Bureau, but um, they're looking for volunteers, so I'm sure if you would contact the Farm Bureau, I know their number's 352-5235, um, you'd be able to get a hold of them if you have a group or want to go up individually. I'm sure they'd take your labor to, it, it, whether it be, probably, I think, I believe in the last year, I didn't go, I was busy, but, um, you know, taking water around even, I think, to, you know, actually digging a hole. So just kind of tie in with that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Quisenberry. Yes, I'd like to thank uh, First Presbyterian Church in Urbana. They invited me to join them last Sunday for uh, a session they've been doing on how different uh, uh, government uh, entities support people in the community. And um, it was a good conversation to have with a number of um, folks who live in the county, about 20 individuals. It was a good experience, and I appreciate their invitation. Thank you. That's very nice. Any other announcements? Well, I, I have not announcements, but I'm going to pass around the sheet again for people to sign up to do the reading at the meeting. And I have mentioned previously about the University of Illinois Leadership Academy, and here is one of the brochures for any of you that are interested in participating. All the sessions are being held in Champaign-Urbana this time, and there is no cost to attend the academy. And there's several of your fellow county board members who have attended if you'd like a little bit more input in whether it's worth your time and effort to do this. Thank you. All right, let's move to the standing committees. Uh, county facilities, Mr. Maxwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, you all have received my report uh, for the March 3rd meeting. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Maxwell? If not, I would like to, uh, again, uh, mention the slight change from my previous announcement on the uh, upcoming meeting, which will be April 9th, Thursday. And uh, it will be, uh, there will be a tour of Ileas as scheduled at 515. And then the meeting will come back over here and start at 630 for uh, our regular meeting. And that was so that we could uh, provide uh, uh, the option to have uh, it taped and also be broadcast. So. Uh, those were the reasons we wanted to be sure that we uh, had as much uh, transparency with this process as we can. Now, we, I have made, uh, thanks to Deb uh, and Van, uh, arrangements to have the consultant appear again before the committee, at which time there'll be several, uh, several of you have expressed some interest in, in uh, having further questions with them. And we've asked all of you to submit your questions to administration before the 1st of April, and uh, in order to be more efficient in the process and, and give uh, the, our consultants a chance to uh, reflect on them before they come to the meeting. Now, there will be additional questions taken, and uh, so if you all 
think of some additional questions you want to come to the committee meeting we would appreciate seeing you there and hopefully uh, if some of your constituents want to get those questions to you uh, and uh, that they may have that they'd like to see the consultant answer please uh, forward those questions as well uh, other than that I believe I, that's all I need to say about it all right any questions for mr. Maxwell in relationship to the upcoming facility meeting all right, then we will place your report on file. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Esri, uh, would you please handle the item that Mr. Quisenberry asked to be pulled from the consent agenda? Sure, thank you. Okay, we have the item B2 from the consent agenda, adoption of ordinance number 959, amending zoning ordinance, zoning case 791-AT-14, and I so move. Uh, Mr. Harkey seconds and Mr. Esri uh, moved. Is there any discussion or questions on this item? Yes, Mr. Alex. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to be very careful here because it's certainly not my intent to uh, second guess a unanimous decision of the ZBA. I assume if this was unanimous, it means that a pretty compelling case was made for this this resolution. but. I have to say I'm, I'm a why I'm concerned and maybe hearing from some of the people on the ZBA could help alleviate this I was on a plan commission for years and and I sort of know how to understand the language and I know that generally when somebody talks about protecting the CR district or you know safety or can, what they're what we're really talking about is wanting to keep their neighbor from doing something that they find objectionable close to their own property and I understand that in any type of a zoning case like this, there is always going to be generally one person who's in support, who's the landowner, and a bunch of people who are in opposition, who's everybody in the neighborhood. So uh, the FAA regulates restricted landing areas, restricted rest, air, uh, regulates helicopter landing areas, and it's always been my contention that the, uh, that the FAA regulations uh, are sufficient to ensure uh, what I would call safety. Now they're not sufficient to perhaps ensure convenience or or ensure that these activities aren't going to inconvenience neighbors or even reduce the value of neighborhoods property or their quality of life. You know that's not what the FAA is there for. They're there to you know ensure that operations are safe. So I guess I just am, would like to hear some of the thought process from the ZBA that went into this and satisfy myself that this is in fact something that's in the public interest as opposed to something that's essentially just being done for the convenience of neighbors to the detriment of, of a landowner. Uh, Mr. Esri, would you like to respond or would you like uh, Mr. Hall to respond or both of you? Well, Mr. Hall can speak too since he is here All right. if he so chooses and probably would, wouldn't be a bad idea. But I do know it was over a year ago when we basically had the initial discussion because, as is mentioned, this was put in on a temporary basis to, at, for a year. We had discussed the fact that, yes, IDOT even, because, you know, it has some say about siting um, rural landing areas um, as long as well as the FFA and everything. That all was considered. But as I say, that was over a year ago, so I don't remember specific talking points. Um, it was brought forward to zoning. Zoning looked at the issue and decided that there were some ad amendments, changes that could be made. Um, and the ZBA looked at it. It went out for public comment. Nothing, as far as I know, there were no public comments against it. Is that correct, John? Or, I mean, and it's it's been out for public comment a second time, I believe, too, to come up to have it come before us again. Is that? Yeah, we've had we've had no comments against it at the public hearing, but, um, you know, I, I don't know necessarily what that means, but um, the whole logic behind the text amendment is that the FAA establishes approach areas for these uh, RLAs and HRLAs. The approach areas have to be kept free of 
anything that would obstruct the aircraft. And um, the experience we had at the ZBA in a previous zoning case was, um, you know, is this approach area in fact clear of vegetation now? Uh, will it remain clear of vegetation into the future? And the only way it could remain clear of vegetation would be to uh, continually cut, reduce the height of the wooded vegetation, which is one of the main reasons for the CR district to exist in the first place. Um, I've always thought it was odd that uh, when they passed the uh, RLA amendment back in the late 80s, that they didn't actually require any setback from the CR district. And um, the CR district was established to protect those wooded areas around the major streams. That suggests the trees are gonna continue to grow. Um, in the zoning case, we analyzed the heights of trees. We analyzed the distance from the RLA. And it was very clear that this individual was wanting to establish an RLA there's a good chance that they would take steps to make sure they could use that RLA into the future. And, and that is not compatible with the purpose of the CR district. Now, um, and that's the whole purpose behind this text amendment. Uh, did I answer some of your questions, Mr. Alex? Yes. Uh so my understanding of what you're saying is that you're saying that the the distances that are set forth in the in the amendment and in the previous temporary amendment are essentially consistent with the FAA requirements to the extent that if you were if you had a piece of property that was large enough to accommodate those approach areas on the property on the subject property that this would not interfere with the ability to operate an RLA. Exactly, and it would not interfere with the CR district. Okay, right, I mean, regardless of what the adjacent zoning is, presumably if you could accommodate the uh, approach areas or the whatever the FAA required or IDOT required buffer is around the actual landing area, if you could accommodate that, if you're a landowner, you can accommodate that on your own land, regardless of what the zoning of the surrounding parcels is, you would be able to do this essentially by right, or would you still require, you'd still require a special use permit? It's still a special use permit. Now, you don't have to have, you do not have to accommodate the approach areas on your own land. That approach area can go out on over your neighbor's land. In fact, it generally does. Um, in fact, the zoning ordinance authorizes the zoning administrator to cut down anything that's planted and grows into that approach area in the future. Um, so it's just inherently incompatible with the whole purpose of the CR district. So these separations are based on the angle of the approach area and the height we would expect the wooded vegetation in the CR district to achieve uh, so that, you know, you can imagine this buffer around the CR district, you could have RLAs uh, outside of that buffer and everything has been provided for. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Harper. Uh, kind of for John there. Uh, during our discussions, didn't we take some data and uh, setbacks and everything from a similar case in King? Was it King County or DeKalb County? Uh, King County actually has even greater restrictions. Uh, we looked at those and they didn't seem appropriate for Champaign County, but they were useful to look at. Are there other questions for either Mr. Esri or Mr. Hall before we take a vote? All right, Mr. Hall, thank you very much for coming this evening. It's appreciated. All right, all of those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, say nay. nay. All right, this passes. All right, uh, Ms. Cowart, would you please take highway and uh, transportation? Okay, the highway and transportation committee has 
no items for um, board consideration. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Cowart? All right. Thank you very much. And now moving to finance, Mr. Alex. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move adoption of resolution number 9159, authorizing payment of claims authorization. Second. All right. Ms. Michaels. All right. And any questions or discussion for Mr. Alex? All right. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. All right, thank you. Next, Mr. Alex. Move adoption of resolution number 9160, authorizing purchases not following the purchasing policy. Uh, Mr. Esri, thank you for the second. Any questions or discussion for Mr. Alex? All right, all of those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. All right, that passes. Next, Mr. Alex. Uh, Finance Committee moves the adoption of resolution number 9161 designated depositories for funds. Is there a second? Did I miss it? Uh, thank you, Ms. Berkson. Any questions or discussion? Yes, Ms. Michaels. I need to recuse myself from this. I'm an employee of making these deposits. <laughs> thank you for putting that on the record. Any other questions or discussions? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. All right, next. Uh, the Finance Committee moves adoption of resolution number 9157, setting rates for animal impound services and animal control services contracts. Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harkey. Uh, any questions or discussion? Yes, Mr. Jay. Uh, is there a second for yes. the? Thank you. Any questions or discussions? All right, will the clerk call the roll then, please? Esri? Nay. Harper? Nay. Harrison? Yes. Hartke? Yes. Jay? No. Maxwell? No. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Quisenberry? Yes. Rosales? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Shore? Yes. Weibel? Yes. Alex? Yes. Anderson? No. Berkson? No. Coart? No. Petrie? Yes. It's been approved. Thank you. I would move adoption, or excuse me, the Finance Committee moves adoption of resolution number 9163, mm -hmm. authorizing an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement regarding the Clinton landfill permit application to accept polychlorinated bifenols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harkey. Uh, yes, Mr. Weibel. I will be abstained from this and the next three items on the agenda. I just want to explain uh, that Mr. Alex brought the point of what I got out of this by abstaining. It's, it's not actually a monetary uh, gain. It's, a, it's in, a matter of influence. Um, let's say at the, if I would support at this level here, it would be hard for me to say that I'm neutral when it comes to me at an upper upper level. So that's why I think it's best to be abstained here than if it comes back to me when I'm serving as when I as a member of the Groundwater Advisory Council, I can say I, you know, I could be more neutral on it at that level. I'm not sure it was me who asked the question, but I appreciate the answer. Thank you for putting that on the record. Any uh, questions or comments other than uh, Mr. Weibel's? All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed. All right, thank you. Moving to number six, please. Uh, finally, finance moves adoption of resolution number 9164, authorizing budget amendment 15-16 from the general corporate fund, increased appropriations of $25,600, which $10,969 re-encumbered from previously appropriated and unspent funds, and $14,631 is new spending required for the amendment to the intergovernmental agreement regarding the Clinton landfill permit application to accept polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Esri, a second. All right, any questions or comments for Mr. Alex? Yeah, this will require a roll call. All right, would the clerk please read, uh, uh, call the roll. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Hartke? Yes. Jay? Yes. 
Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Quisenberry? Yes. Rosales? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Shore? Yes. Weibel? Alex? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Berkson? Yes. Coert? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Um, approved. Thank you very much, Mr. Alex. Uh, Mr. Quisenberry. Yes, thank you. Um, the Policy Personnel and Appointments Committee moves the adoption of resolution number 9165 in support of Senate Bills 1698 and House Bill 1326, and I so move. Uh, Mr. Shorer seconds. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Quisenberry? Just because. I'll, I'll be abstaining from this one, too. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. All of those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No? One. All right. Thank you very much. That gets approved. Do you want to continue with the addendum? I sure will. Um, we have an item on the addendum that did not come through... Uh, the policy committee. Uh, so I will make a motion that we adopt resolution number 9174 calling for the governor and general assembly to protect necessary funding for county government. Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harkey. Yes, Mr. Weibel. I'd like to move to suspend rule 12 F3 so because it did not go through the committee so we can vote on it and follow our own rules. All right. Is there a second for that? Second. Thank you again, Mr. Harkey. Any question on uh, Mr. Weibel's motion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Yeah. All right, Mr. J. All right, now back to the original motion. Are there any questions or comments on that? Yes, Mr. Harper. Uh, Deb's probably not going to like me, but um, the state we're in in this state is terrible. And do I want to give up money that's rightfully ours? No. But at our Farm Bureau meeting there Tuesday morning, Senator Bennett was there, the new senator. And uh, he goes, I wouldn't wish the job Mr. Rounder's got to anybody. And he said, it's a terrible mess. So... My feeling is everybody's going to have to do their part if we're going to try to fix things. Is it going to be pretty? Nope. And I think it's going to be ugly for everybody in this state to fix all the problems. So for those reasons, I will not be supporting this resolution. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper. Mr. McGuire. Um, I understand that sentiment. I, I think there's a lot of problems the state has. I, I think, like people talk about, the legislation is you know, a sausage, and I think we ought to let the, you know, the state know how we think about this, this process um, because money in the state usually goes a lot of different directions, mostly north, and we ought to be able to just, you know, make sure that the funding stays more south and tell them, um, you know, our, our feelings on what the issues are of the state. Um, this money actually comes from our local taxpayers and goes to the state, and we want to try to keep it coming back this direction. Um, this isn't about cutting a, a state um, budget item or stopping actual state dollars themselves from coming and being spent in, in this county. It's about our local tax dollars returning to us. So I'd like to support it. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Did you have a comment, Mr. Weibel? Yes, I will support this. Um, uh, throughout these years, while the state has not been doing what they're supposed to be doing, this county board has had balanced budgets, and we've made cuts when we need to make cuts, and so on and so forth. In fact, when I was county board chair, I can tell you the, the last budget that we voted on was less than my first budget, and that's over six years. So we've been doing our job, so why should we be punished for the state not doing their job. So I will support this. 
Thank you, Mr. Weibo. Are there any other comments? Um, yes. So one note I would just like to make too. Um, so with the, I mean, we have statute that already says how much money needs to be allocated out to the counties because the state's really the pass through. That's why we don't have county income taxes like Indiana. So because of the precedent that's already in statute, if we don't receive the local distributive fund, we could be looking at a class action lawsuit with other counties, townships, mayors. There's a lot of feeling out there that if funds are swept from that type of light item, then you are looking at other issues because it's already in statute. It's 35 ILCS 5901 if you want to look at it. Um, and that's where it talks about like the percentage that needs to be distributed back out. So I think that's why I will probably be supporting this because if you want to change those equations, then you'd have to go into the statute and make those changes, and that's not what's been on in discussion. So the state should be doing their job and bringing that money back to the local governments to be dispersed out. Uh, thank you, Ms. Harrison, and for that explanation. Any other? Yes, Mr. J. Microphone. There. I generally don't need it. Uh, I truly believe that this state's in such a sad state of affairs as uh, that I've seen in my lifetime, quite frankly, and that we're all going to have to pitch in to get it out and not worry about protecting our little sacred uh, sum of money over here. It needs to be spread across all of us in the state of Illinois, including those folks up north who don't want to pay their fair share either. I, don't, I think that we need to set a precedent that, that we understand that this is a serious problem and we'll do our part to do whatever we can to help us get out of this hole. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. J. Yes, Mr. Alex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me that, Ms. Berkson. It just seems to me that lowering the state taxes and then saying how broke the state is is not the way to restore our state to financial soundness. So they should at least put the income tax back up before they talk about how, how they're suffering. Thank you very much, Ms. Burks. And now, Mr. Alex. i just like to say, I mean, I, I agree with Mr. Harper and Mr. Jay. I don't think that we're going to get through this financial crisis without there being cuts at all levels of government. But the state's also got to understand that if they want us to participate by taking this money away, they got to tell us who, who we can stop collecting property tax from to help out their, their buddies. They got to go back and look at revenues again. They got to reduce the number of mandates they're putting on local governments. It's telling us how we can spend our money. They got to stop, you know, look at ways that they can uh, address these cut reductions in Medicaid spending. They're killing nursing homes and things like this. I mean, it, I'm happy to work with the state, but working with the state does not mean them continuing to view this as a one-sided relationship. So I got no problem pushing back at him a little bit. Thank you very much, Mr. Alex. Mr. Harper. Uh, I, I agree with Ms. Berkson that the income tax, and I hate to say it, but I think it's going to have to come back. But they passed that. They raised the income tax, and they did nothing about spending cuts. They did not. They, they neglected paying their bills for so long they raised the taxes and still did nothing to make any cuts. So, yeah, they've tried the income tax once and that didn't help. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Other comments from around the table? All right, are we ready to vote then? All right, all of those in favor? Does uh, the, do we need a roll call in the resolution itself that asks for one? On the page, too. Well, we can have a roll call. Will somebody call for a roll call? Second. <laughs> Sorry, it could be a show of hands. Okay. It would be fine. All right. All right, a show of hands. All of those in favor of this uh, <clears throat> resolution, please indicate by raising your hands. Yes. Okay, those opposed, just to make sure. <laughs> Mr. J. <laughs> All right, it does pass, and um, thank you very much for your 
support for both of these resolutions. Yes. Yeah, about a good point of order. It was the purpose of the request for roll call to indicate the strength of the support. If so, we should indicate the number of ayes and nays in the resolution. It will be? Okay, thank you. All right. All right, uh, I just want to let everybody know um, that I will make certain that both of these resolutions are made available for the meeting on the 28th of March when our regional representatives will be joining us for that meeting um, being put on by the Illinois Association of County Board Members. Mr. Quisenberry. That, that's all for policy. All right, thank you very much. All right, any other uh, business for this evening? Yes, Mr. Quisenberry again. Under other business. Um, I just want to call everybody's attention to the agenda and the supporting documents for the study session next week. Um, we will be working together. This is a working meeting. This is an, a meeting that you need to bring ideas and expectations okay. for our our term here on the board, the next two years, no idea is too small, no idea is too big. Um, there's no guarantees that any of them will get done. It's just a sharing sharing situation. So please please read through this and come prepared uh, to, to work a little bit. And the incentive is that there will be food for that evening. Starts at six, remember, it, it starts at 6 o'clock. All right, any new business? All right, I'll entertain a, a motion to adjourn. Mr. Harper, Mr. Rosales, a second. Is it unanimous? Yes, all right, thank you everyone.